In today's video, we're talking about the possibility of the Edmonton Oilers and Toronto Maple Leafs being good trade partners. Plus, we also have some other trade rumors from around the league, including some talk around the Philadelphia Flyers, the Boston Bruins, and could the Buffalo Sabres be a dark horse team for Jacob Chikrin services. Plus, we also have several roster moves and a signing in Colorado, plus some news from the waiver wire. All that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As you can see, I'm not in my normal recording studios. I'm actually on family vacation right now. Still going to be posting regular content while we're away, as I normally always do. We're actually coming to you today uh, live from Orlando, Florida at Walt Disney World. As you can see behind me, you can see the Disney-themed uh, room here that we're in. So you can see Pluto taking a nap over my shoulder. So certainly, um, you know, going to have lots of fun. Uh, certainly going to do a pro I might do some videos out uh, within the resort or within the parks. I don't know. We'll kind of wait and see. This is my first video here on Disney property. So we'll just kind of go with the flow, see what happens. Uh, you might get a lot of videos here from the resort. I'm not sure, but uh, on to today's news. But as you can see, for the next probably couple of weeks, you're going to see a lot of videos from the road uh, from Florida. So hopefully we get some good weather and have a great time. That's certainly what we're hoping to do here. Uh, the waiver wire news was interesting today. Uh, yesterday, while I was traveling, we had the Buffalo Sabres place uh, forward and centerman Riley Shahan on waivers. Uh, Shahan has been on unconditional waivers though for the purpose of contract termination. So Riley Shahan was recently demoted and it was not really getting any playing time in Buffalo and kind of getting frustrated and he asked to be released from the contract, confident he could find enough, uh, you know, ample opportunities elsewhere. So the short-term deal that he was signed to uh, earlier has been now terminated since he did clear unconditional waivers today. You, do, you usually don't see players ever picked up on those uh, anyways because they know it's for contract termination. And the Boston Bruins today have placed defenseman Anton Strawman on waivers. Of course, Strawman ended up going to camp late with the Bruins on a PTO ended up getting signed of course the Bruins at one point early in the season had a lot of injuries now they're starting to get guys back and they need to make some subsequent moves there's also thought that this could even lead to a, a you know a short-term trade by the Bruins because part of this is could be the fact that defenseman Derek Forward is uh, getting close to returning he should be back here very very shortly so with Forward's return it's kind of you know, they need a roster spot. They need cap space. And there's obviously got Mike Riley. He's already been buried in the minors. He's one victim here of the cap crunch and situation and on the blue line in, in Beantown. And then, of course, now we've got Strollman, um, who's kind of the odd man out as well. I'm not sure what's going to happen here. Uh, I suspect he'll clear. He's appeared in 13 games and has uh, no points. And uh, the defensive metrics haven't been fantastic for him. So he's done okay, but not overly great. So I, I don't expect him to get picked up. And I'm not sure if he's going to want to be really going down and reporting to the AHL. So we'll have to see and monitor that. But the Bruins have some other players, uh, whether it be Riley or whether it be Strawman or maybe even a guy like Craig Smith, who could be a trade candidate should they be able to figure out moving a, a salary or two off the roster to create the space to activate forward when he comes back. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what the Bruins do. But there will be some activity um, besides this player going on waivers for Boston here in the next little bit as they create the space necessary to bring back one of their better defensemen. Now on to some other news. We also had a signing in Colorado. They've signed Alex Galchenyuk. Now this might be surprising to some. I'm not overly surprised by this. Uh, when Galchenyuk went to training camp on a PTO with the Avalanche, he was released and it didn't happen too long into the PTO. And some wondered if this might be the end of the road for him. But the main reason why uh, he was released and Jared Bednar, the coach of the Avalanche, even talked about this a little bit at the time as well, was that he got hurt and he wasn't going to be able to participate uh, throughout the rest of training camp. It was going to be a longer term injury. So this tells me that he's obviously had time to uh, you know heal and recover. They obviously were happy enough with what they've seen. We we also know that the Avalanche have been dealing with their fair share bit of the injury bug as well. And because of that, uh, they've given him an opportunity here. So uh, he gets a one-year deal at the 750000 uh, so nothing major, no big risk, no uh, you know long-term or anything of that nature, which you wouldn't expect. And he gets another shot at a crack here at the NHL. So we'll see if Galchenyuk can make 
the most of this opportunity here yet again. And on, on to several other roster moves. Uh, we, ha we saw the uh, Ottawa Senators, after picking up another victory in Los Angeles last night, they've sent a couple of players back to the minors, including goalie Kevin Mandelis and defenseman Lassie Thompson. Uh, this may or may not indicate players ready to return because it could be more of a case uh, the fact that they just have a, a few days off and they may want them to be able to go down. Obviously, it saves the team a little bit of money, but they may be able to play at least one American Hockey League game before they are recalled possibly for Wednesday's game at home against the Rangers. Uh, they finished their West Coast trip with back-to-back -back victories in Anaheim and L.A., so they had a four-game winning streak at one point early than they lost. It was a eight in a row or nine, whatever it was, a big number. Uh, terrible you know, stretch, which many are saying could have ruined their chances at playoffs again, and it very well could. But now we got a, you know the momentum going the other way, and we'll see if they can, uh, you know, swing things around because it's certainly it's necessary. If they don't have a big winning streak now to offset those losses, they're going to be, uh, you know, getting themselves behind the eight ball too far and playing catch up the rest of the year, and it's probably going to be over far over, uh, far before the end of the season, and they're not going to get to play those meaningful games and at least be in the race near the end of the season like they were hoping to do as well here. Uh, now, but some other moves as well. The Minnesota Wild have demoted uh, one of their top prospects and young players, Marco Rossi. Um, Marco Rossi had a real solid year in Iowa last year in the American Hockey League. Uh, of course, you know, he had um, some injuries and some issues with COVID and things like that after being drafted. Uh, so there was a, some lost time there for sure, but he, he rebounded well last year, had a first good pro season in North America, got a little bit of NHL time. And this year he hasn't produced, and maybe it's the, the line combinations, the role he's been given, I'm not sure. I haven't seen a lot of wild games. I have seen some, uh, but not enough to really have a you know a real good judgment on this player. But, but Rossi's only put up one assist in 16 games, and he's minus four. So certainly not endearing himself to the coaching staff there and going to go down and see if he can get some top minutes and regain some confidence, and we'll see what happens in Minnesota. Certainly uh, you know, a team that's looking to make some improvements here as the season goes along. The New Jersey Devils have recalled a trio of players, including goalie Nico Dawes, defenseman Kevin Ball, and forward Alexander Holtz. The New York Islanders have recalled Robin Sallow as well, so hopefully he can get into some game action. He was just recently demoted in the past couple days and then brought right back up, so hopefully uh, Sallow can get a chance to prove himself. Of course, the Islanders are having a pretty solid year. I really thought he might be able to secure himself down in that bottom pair, but it looks like Sebastian Ajo has got more of the playing time so far this season, so we'll see if Sallow can make the most of this recall. The Maple Leafs have demoted defenseman Victor Mete. This is not going to be good for his career. The fact that they've been even going to guys like Mac Hollowell with no experience over Mete just goes to show you, as I mentioned before, that the coaching staff, I don't think, give a lot of trust and confidence in him. So certainly I'm not really sure that we're going to see Mete with a great deal of opportunity there in Toronto. Uh, he's a player that's kind of bounced around a bit ever since leaving Montreal. He's now had stomps in Ottawa, now went over to Toronto. And he just he sometimes has like a small flashes where he looks good but just can't seem to, to get it consistently and can't stick so I don't know I, I'm not really sure that this is a situation in Toronto is going to materialize well for him wouldn't be surprised if the Leafs try to find a way to move on from him but I'm not sure there's going to be many takers out there the Sharks have also placed goalie James Reimer on injured reserve. So the Sharks are having a tough season. They're going to be without their you know, top goalie for at least a week to 10 days there. So that's certainly not good news. And the Winnipeg Jets have also returned young defenseman Vili Hainola. I know he was recently recalled and uh, was looking for more playing time. We know he's been unhappy being stuck in the minors. And it doesn't sound like we haven't heard any rumors out of Winnipeg that there's anything really pending on a trade of either himself or any of his uh, defensive teammates opening up a spot for him. Going back to the minors is probably something he's not going to be overly thrilled with. Now, of course, we also saw Rachel Dory go public recently here on Twitter over the last 24 hours or so with her uh, issues with the Vancouver Canucks. We know Dory was hired as an analyst uh, for the analytics department uh, in the offseason and then throughout the summer was promoted uh, to work with the video coach and being assistant coach to, to uh, head coach Bruce Boudreaux. And then we know before the start of the season uh, or early in the season or preseason, whatever it was, that she was abruptly with no explanation, let go. And it was very confusing. Uh, we knew and heard that there was some sort of lawsuit coming, and now she's published everything here. Uh, she's filed a human rights complaint. Um, really, if you want to go onto her Twitter account, you can read the whole thing. I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but essentially it sounds like she's accusing Assistant General Manager Emily Castongay uh, of also kind of 
uh, you know, not being fond of her for no reason. Essentially, uh, you know, at one point, Dory, uh, who knows uh, reporter Patrick Johnson, works for the province, uh, or newspaper in Vancouver. Uh, he had made some uh, an article referencing one of her promotions, and it seems to cause a lot of trouble. It does seem a little bit ridiculous, but at the same time, you don't know if all these allegations are true. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure the lawsuit's going to go too far, but uh, it's it's really hard to say. It, it's it's really in a tough spot. But I hope that because it, it looks bad, right? Because you're trying to see. It's nice to see more, um, you know, of a diverse group in Vancouver, and other teams are starting to take on the same approach here. Uh, Jim Rutherford made it known he wanted to get a team in place that had, um, you know, a, a diverse background and a diverse, uh, you know, way of thinking, include, you know, different groups out there and making sure that there were some women involved. Uh, you know, you want people from different backgrounds just to, you know, to kind of create the best, uh, you know, possible group here to make sure you can uh, have the best management team possible. And obviously they hired a variety of people this off season, which really aligned with that philosophy. And now it seems like a couple of the ladies there that were hired just did not work well together at all. And they were falling out and, now there's a lawsuit in place, so we'll see if anything comes from this. Um, it's just a, it's a real unfortunate situation. I know there's a lot of people that were very fond of Rachel Dory around the NHL community. Really think she does a lot of great work, and uh, this lawsuit, like I said, doesn't give the Canucks or Emily Castonegate a great look if they were proven to be true. I just I wonder if she may have a hard time um, kind of validating or, or these claims about only time will tell and her time uh, you see if there's a, a settlement or if it goes to court or what have you but it's uh, you know not a good look and you hate to see these kind of situations arise and it sounds like she might want to move on now from not even working in hockey um it's a tough business to crack into her one of her uh, opening lines is that it's a male dominated industry and that it's you know really really hard uh, for people with different backgrounds, women, etc., minorities to really break in and get any kind of a substantial role. And then she starts to do that, and then it goes bad quickly, right? So anyways, we'll see what comes from this, but we finally know a little bit more details, at least her side of the story, as to what happened. And the Canucks right now, all they've said in a statement from the management team and Emily Castle Gaze, they, they don't agree with the statements that Dory's made. They say that's not what happened, but I'm not sure. They're obviously not going to comment any further or it's a legal matter. Now, some other trade talk around the league as well. The Philadelphia Flyers are a team that we should see a deal uh, of some sort with here in the next little while. I know Elliot Freeman mentioned this as well in 32 Thoughts, and it does make sense. They do have a veteran, Artem Anisimov, who I know I can't imagine having any kind of a huge impact here on the Flyers, but he is with their American Hockey League affiliate, and they would like to sign him and bring him to the NHL rosters, but reports indicate, but they're at the 50 contract max, so they can't even sign anybody to another pro contract. So that's obviously part of the issue here as well, uh, and they need to shed some cap space, roster space, everything thing to make this work but besides the fact uh, I don't think they'd be too worried about Anisimov if they were winning they had a good start to the season and they're on a disastrous run they've come back down to earth now the Flyers that we see lately are what many of us expected from the get-go uh, I can't remember how many games they're at now in a row without a regulation win I think it's like 10 I think they have a few overtime losses in there during that stretch so they have picked up a few points but it's certainly a, a terrible stretch and now like I said they're come crashing down and they're falling in the standings closer to where what a lot of us pegged them to be from the get-go. So to make this happen, to bring up Anisimov, a couple of names that you could watch for that might make sense here would be defenseman Justin Braun, maybe for Patrick Brown, who recently returned. There's even been some talk about Travis Konechny, but of course he's injured now, so I think there's a less likely, less likelihood of that happening anytime soon. There's some out there that think the uh, Flyers really should pounce on the fact that Kevin Hayes is having a nice season. Now the problem with Hayes, though, of course, uh, you know, past the age of 30 now and has three more years over seven million bucks on that contract. The Flyers, I think, would have to eat a fair bit of money to really get a taker. But right now, Hayes is having a really solid year on a not-so-solid team, putting up a point-per-game status over 22 games. So if you look at his numbers right now, things look good. But at the same time, he's uh, you know healthy for the first time in a while, which is obviously helping matters. And he's also getting big minutes with all the injuries that the Flyers have had. Uh, you know He's a guy who probably should be their third-line center, and he's playing all the important minutes top line a lot of the time. So obviously... You know, he's getting a lot more opportunity than he normally would, which also might explain why the numbers go up. Not to say that he's not a decent hockey player, but certainly uh, 
there are some you know aspects to his game that could help other teams for sure. Certainly some aspects that other teams may not be fond of. I know foot speed's always been a bit of a concern for Hayes. Um, you know, but the problem here is like three more years after this year over seven million dollars would be very challenging to move. I do understand the concept of trying to sell high because his point per game totals right now are really good. It might be an opportunity to sell while he's playing well, and I wouldn't uh, completely rule that out. It's just going to be really challenging, so I'm not really sure that that's something we should look for here anytime soon. The Kings are reportedly looking for a left shot defenseman as well, according to Elliot Freeman and Mer Jeff Merrick, um, and they have a lot of other defensemen, including some right shot D that could be made available to make this happen. Look for them to maybe move uh, either guys like Walker or Matt Roy. I know Sean Walker and, and Roy are both players have been mentioned here before uh, but it's something that's increasingly becoming more important uh, they also have some more younger defensemen that they want to get more of an opportunity for including a guy like Brent Clark who was just recalled from a conditioning stint so uh, I would suspect uh, that we'll likely see the Kings maybe make a defensive trade in the not too distant future but that's something that's been kind of harping around the rumor mill for the last couple of weeks and hasn't happened yet so uh, we'll see if it happens here in short order but it wouldn't be shocking if it did now could the Buffalo Sabres also be a dark horse in the Jacob Chikrin trade sweepstakes. That's a real possibility, according to Jeff Merrick on the latest 32 Thoughts segment on Hockey Night in Canada. Of course, the Buffalo Sabres have a pretty good group of young D. I mean, lately, I think it's fair to say they haven't uh, been doing the best, but there's still tons of potential, lots of the like there, but the future. Of course, you've got Rasmus Dahlin, you've got Owen Power, you get Matias Samuelson, and Jacob Chikrin, in a way, would be a nice compliment for that. Well, the only problem is that they have a lot of left-hand shots, but guys like Power and Dahlin have both, throughout their young careers here, have experimented playing the weak side, so it is possible they could make do here if they wanted to go about this, but they do have a lot of other interesting young prospects not yet in the NHL roster or just getting started that they could consider to the Coyotes as trade bait for Chikrin if they can pull this off. Of course, obviously holding lots of draft picks moving forward as well. So it'll be interesting to see here. I know for the most part you've heard teams like the Kings or the Jackets, the Senators, but the main teams mentioned in Chikrin, but could Buffalo maybe surprise us and get more involved here and pull it off? And lastly, could the Oilers and Maple Leafs make good trade partners? It certainly does make sense to some degree, and it wouldn't necessarily be a big blockbuster deal, but we do know the Edmonton Oilers, according to Elliot Freeman, have been shopping for a forward with edge. While the Leafs have that in a player like Wayne Simmons, who has not really been getting much playing time, a very limited role, and it is well reported that the Leafs would like to move. The only problem is, is that Wayne Simmons, I think, has a bit of an emotional attachment to a lot of his teammates, and I don't think any of his teammates really want him to go. Uh, it's kind of one of those situations where um, I think the Leafs would like to keep him in a sense. They just they're they're playing a different style of game. They're not overly overly focused on that that grit and that toughness that he can bring. Uh, they're more focused on speed and skill and coming with a different lineup that they feel works better for what that team is developed and what their identity is. So, you know, moving him makes a ton of sense when you can't find a spot for a player in your lineup. Same goes for a guy like Alex Kerfoot. Uh, not to say that he can't fit in with that type of play, but, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that at least have had a difficult time finding where he fits best, and he's also had a difficult time producing this year, which has not made matters any better. Now, of course, what the Oilers could offer back would be a defenseman, which the Leafs desperately could use some more experience on. They have a, a ravaged little handful of injuries. Maybe a player like Ryan Murray, who signed a one-year minimum contract with the Oilers, could be intriguing to the Maple Leafs in exchange for Wayne Simmons. It'd be a chance for you know two veteran guys to be swapped one for one and possibly you know get a better role with their new clubs. I mean, Murray is getting a chance to play more with the Oilers than Simmons is with Edmonton, but we know the Oilers are certainly trying to get guys like like Broberg more of an opportunity. Bouchard's been playing better lately as well. You know, could get some of those other young guys in the mix there. So it, it, it could make sense. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but based on comments from Eric and Friedman and kind of the link here between all these, it does sound like there could be, uh, you know, a lot of sense there. I'm not sure that they've actually had legit conversations around this as of yet. But there must be something going on behind the scenes to lead these guys to kind of, you know, connect the dots, so to speak, that it could be something that we might see here in the near future. So I, I'm skeptical myself that the Leafs will trade Simmons, not because they wouldn't like to. I just think that they have to analyze the overall effect of him on the room and the teammates and everything. And by moving him, you know, do they really want to do that? And if at some point later in the season into the playoffs, they do want to have that type of player then they don't really have anybody else on that roster. At least I don't think they can really jump in and kind of play the kind of role that he can do. And it might be challenging for them to re 
acquire that or find it again. So we'll see what happens. But anyway, that is all your news and rumors for today. Let me know your thoughts, something to discuss. Of course, down in the comments below, and we'll talk about it further. If you're new to the channel, of course, make sure you subscribe, stick around. As I mentioned, I won't be recording from my home studio for the next couple of weeks while I'm on the road here in vacation. You'll be seeing lots of different senior, hopefully here from Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. And um, like I said, hoping for a good trip, hoping for lots of hockey news to talk about. Like I said, subscribe and stick around. And we'll even though I'm on vacation, we'll keep you up to date with all the goings on from around the league. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.